really the goal is just to use our stories to bring veterinary medicine to life for the pet caretakers of the world. Uh, and we're doing it because we believe that educating these caretakers is the most powerful thing that we can do to improve the life quality of all of the pets that we love. Hello, Dr. Natalie Keith here. Dr. Tracy Trussell here. And back to Vet Tales. Here we go. I don't even know what episode we're on now. I should probably look. Probably see. look, see where we are. I bet we're pushing up to 30 and getting close. 28 maybe? I don't know. It should be, should be at least in the high 20s. Depends on what order I publish these in. Yeah. That's going to, yeah. So we'll see. Anyway, so yeah, luckily you checked your schedule today and realized we were having a podcast recording time set aside. And I even pre-picked a topic, which was pretty outstanding for my normal routine. And so we decided to go with fractures. We did. And why are we late starting our podcast recording time? Because I actually had a follow-up appointment on a fracture repair I did about a month ago. There you have it. Live and in action. Tell it just let's just start with a tale. Tell us the story of this little dog. What I assume it's a dog. This was a dog. Cats are just so much better at not breaking themselves. They are, and they're better at hiding it when they do. And healing on their own, oddly yes. enough. Crazy little things. Anyway, so uh, this one dog was out where I think where it should have been. The, the story's a little fuzzy. It was a month ago. Best I remember, the dog was somewhere that it shouldn't have been. Nothing. What kind of dog is this? Mm, hound mix. Yeah, 65 yeah. Sixty-five to seventy pounds. How old is he? Fairly young, four, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and there, I think he was on the neighbor's cow pasture, and anyway, he got shot, and the. The shot broke his femur, left femur, to be more precise. Did and you tell what kind of bullet it was? Don't remember if we had any. I don't think we had anything left in there. I think it did just a pass through, through. and just a, a little bit of metal bits. Yeah, but left it was. Uh, I mean, it was. It was a high caliber. It wasn't twenty two. Right now, we see those all the time. I mean, I, my guess, deer rifle of some sort, two forty three, two seventy, somewhere in there. Interesting. And and that's just just a guess. Like I said, I didn't even think about the story and and look at the X rays and and remind myself of all that. Anyway, it was presented was a referral, if I do remember right. I think they were about thirty forty five minutes away. Yeah, you see anyway. a lot of those. People send you a lot of fractures I do. and knees. I do. I mean that that's kind of my passion. I I love my orthopedic surgeries. Yeah. I mean it's. This is going to make it sound bad, and a lot of people that do surgeries won't like me comparing it to this. It's just you're you're a mechanic. You're just putting the pieces back together, yeah, making it function. And, and as a guy who used to do tractor repairs, yeah, I mean that's what I grew up. Now. I was a mechanic growing up, yeah. So I mean, it just it's kind of in my wheelhouse. So and yeah, and, and words gotten out a little bit. I've talked to you know some of our colleagues, and and do get a a decent number of referrals coming in. I feel like less. General practitioners do fracture repairs these days. Like when I was growing up, all the vets did them, but they weren't like especially trained in them. And so right. it was kind of. Yeah. It, what we've found, what I found that I, I did fracture repairs for a long time. And then in, I think it was 2017, somewhere in there, about mm -hmm. six, seven years ago, somewhere in there, went uh, like, because I was having some fracture repairs that weren't coming out we weren't getting the outcomes that i wanted i was like I, i've got to go learn something so I'm, I'm missing something here and so i did i went to a wet lab three days of doing nothing but surgery with boarded surgeons they're guiding us and i found out that yeah i'd been doing a whole lot of it wrong <laughs> it's terrifying realization also just fun fact board certified means essentially that these doctors graduated vet school then went to an internship then went to a residency and then sat for boards essentially to become officially specialized in a certain thing so you might have a dermatologist an ophthalmologist and then you can have board certified surgeons you know and so forth right. so that's these are the people you're learning from right i mean these are the guys, that's all they do yeah and that they do the life. weird ones that nobody else wants to do. Yeah, they they get to see the ones now that the guys like me couldn't fix. Yeah, in there. So I mean, you know, they're and they're kind of on the forefront of coming up with what's new and and what's best. And you know, they like I said, they'll get the ones that people may have tried and it didn't work. 
maybe had an, an improper construct in there that didn't work. So they're, they're a lot of times having to think outside the box to figure out a way to fix this fracture that didn't heal right. Malunions. Yeah, you know, yeah, malunions, non-unions. Like and, that little poodle. We'll have to tell that story next. Anyway. And so, you know, there's, I mean, when a lot of the times when these guys see them, it's it's a last-ditch effort. I mean, that's that's your option. Prior to amputation, yeah. Yeah, yeah prior to, to losing a limb. If, also, side note, if you ever go to your vet and they're like, we should amputate when your dog's leg is broken, I would encourage you to get a second opinion because we hear that a lot. People come in for a second opinion because their vet told them to amputate, and then Dr. Trussell fixes it. Yeah, and I've, and, but sometimes that is the right answer. Mm-hmm. I've had, but it's worth checking on before you decide. Oh, I mean, I'd have to. I, I don't know that I have have this written down, but I've probably had, I'm gonna say thirty, come in that they're like, "Hey, we want a second opinion." Our our vet said we need to amputate. And on two of them, I was like, yeah, we, we've got to amputate. There's no, there's nothing left to fix. Yeah, and that a lot of times will be those cats that got caught in a car engine thing or, you know, where it's just. Yeah, we had the one, the one that really sticks in my mind was, uh, oh, okay, what was the dog's name? He was a pointer. Mm. I remember the owner's name. The German short hair pointer. German short hair pointer. I mean, this yep. this dog was yep. field trial extraordinaire. I mean, top line stud yep. dog. I mean, this man, he's, he, this dog's good enough for man. Prized to possession. Yes. Yeah. And so he, it was on emergency. It was just kind of a weird fluke deal. I think he fell out of the side by side. He was riding, going and checking cows, I think. Mm. And fell out of side by side, got run over, broke his leg, took in. It was on a Sunday morning, Saturday night, something. Anyway, they took to the ER clinic and they're like, yeah, we, you just need to amputate that leg. And so he calls up and says, hey, when you take a look at this and see, you know, he's, he told me this, you know, story of the dog. He's like, he's a prize, you know, field trial dog. And, you know, listed off all of his, some of his accomplishments, and I've seen them. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'll take a take a look at him. Brought him down, had their x-rays. I took, a, I think I took a few more here. And I was like, guys, there's there's nothing left there to put back together. Oh, I'd, gosh, yeah. Like, I, I can't. He's got to be. the only, Our only option to keep him alive is to amputate his leg. Mm-hmm. And so we talked through all that, did. Like I said, that's not that's never my first option in there, if there's any way around it. But the, on him, there wasn't any way around it. Luckily, he ended up going, did well through surgery. He started swimming him two to three times a week. And I think it was three months post-surgery, post-amputation, he went and won his field trial on three legs. <laughs> oh my gosh. And you could look at him in the picture, had no idea he was in three legs. Because he just, that swimming built his core Muscle up, up so, so much where he didn't. That he stood flat. That is amazing. But yeah, there was that one. And then there was a, there was a cat. I remember they come yeah. in there like. That yeah, orange and cat. Yeah. And yeah. I I'm remember like, yeah, that. there's, there's nothing there to put back together. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times on those cats too, there's so much soft tissue trauma around the fracture that gangrene is a bigger issue than anything. So. Yeah. Because most of the cats are a trauma. You there know, goes our of, construction equipment. Sorry. Yeah. You Progress. know, dog fights, you know, especially this time of year or in the winter right now, it's well, January 20 something. Fourth. Okay. If you say so. Mm-hmm. I don't know what day it is. Uh, you know, it's cold. Well, cats are outside. You come home, the car engine's warm. They crawl up in the engine department, go out in the morning, crank up, get a leg caught in the fan belt. You know, so. And that, yeah, that kind of trauma, you know, twisting i guess you could say is just not there's not much left no and, and it causes a lot of nerve damage causes some nerve damage causes a lot of abrasions in the skin is the the big thing we see with, mm-hmm. with a lot of the fractures it is like yeah we can we can go fix the bone but our problem may be getting the infection out that's already there mm-hmm. and just having adequate blood flow to that right. area at that point is it's a tricky one. Well, anyway, we have to get back to the dog that got shot. So he got shot. Then uh, what? Got shot. Went to their, their normal veterinarian. And he's like, yeah, you, you need to go have somebody look at this. So call call up. They come over here. He looks like, yeah, we've got a pretty good fracture, but shouldn't be any any big issue to fix. I'm going to take us a while to heal because we were missing some bone. There's some mm-hmm. bone just not there. And so that was mid-December 18th or 19th, I think, was when we ended up doing the surgery. And placed a, a pin and a plate, locking plate in there. 
and checked it today. We're forming a good callus, which is how the body heals a bone. Mm-hmm. And now I'll get into, remind me, I'll get into that, the healing process in yeah. just a second. Anyways, but the dog's doing well, not really walking on the leg yet, which, you know, the leg's still fractured. I mean, we're, we're a month out. They they heal like we do. Well, it and takes he, about two you know, months. with a gunshot, you had so much muscle trauma too that, that you know, that the <coughs> muscles themselves are going to be, you know, not exactly on board for a lot of movement. As opposed to an animal that's just like, let's say, kicked by a cow and it just pops up mm-hmm. like fracture. You know, when you've got a bullet that has torn through multiple muscles, you're going to have a slower time back to ambulation. Yeah, I mean, you've got two to three weeks of of soft tissue healing that the body's going to work on and, and try to work on in conjunction with the bone. That's It's actually going to slow the bone healing down. Yeah, the because you've got to get some blood flow. And so, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're five or four weeks out, four and a half weeks out from surgery. Dog's doing okay. I mean, of course, we all want them walking as soon as they can. But you look at it and it's probably where we should be. You know, all the soft tissues healed up in there bones forming a good callus mm-hmm. so you know we're, we're where we're supposed to be we'll come in about a month and take radiographs and see where we are okay so back to the the bone healing there's there's two ways the body will heal a bone one if you can completely rebuild a bony column pushing, meaning like putting the bottom half in line with the top half and yes. putting them together yeah we're basically, like fixing a broken vase yeah yeah if you, if you fix a broken vase and make it look like it was never broken you know, you can do this. Sometimes you can do that with some fractures. Mm-hmm. Um, I love those fractures because what, how that heals is it doesn't form the big callus. It doesn't deform the bone any. The cellular layers, there's tubules going through those bones. The, like a tree trunk. Like a tree trunk. And those cells go, you know, go across that. Well, when you, when you fracture a bone, you fracture through those. If you can get all of those lined back up and then hold it steady. Those a lot of times those bones will be healed in four weeks, which that holding it steady I think is worth kind of like sitting on that for a second and talking about how important that is. That is uber important. If you can't hold the bone steady, if you can't hold the fracture pieces in the same orientation where they don't move hardly at all, there's some there's some micro motion that has to happen. We won't get into that. That's way too too in depth. But basically, you've got to hold those pieces there together where they don't move till the body can bridge all of that. Yep. And you have... And that's where so much of the pain comes from is that motion yes. of the bone moving in there. So once that leg is stabilized and and, and a, the mechanisms that you use to stabilize surgically are so, so... Like, it's I, I don't even want to put it in the same podcast as splinting. No. Like, and, and cast. Like, this is just... That is an archaic way to manage these types of situations unless, you know, a situation calls for it. Like if a pet can't go under anesthesia or if they don't have the funding available, people will still try it. But honestly, I don't even know that it saves you that much money because it's so much upkeep. It, it generally doesn't. Putting a splint on, I've got two dogs in splints right now. I despise splints. But Keeping I have them to, clean and dry as a bear. Yeah, I have two in splints right now. But the reason that I don't like them is because you have a lot of extra issues. You get a lot of pressure sores under them. You got to keep them clean. You got to keep them dry. If they get wet, we have to change that wrap right now. Mm-hmm. If it gets too tight, if it gets too loose. Right. I mean, it's got to be, I mean, I hate to say the word, but it has to be almost perfect when you put it on. And then we've got to change it. I mean, if you can get 10 days out of a splint, you're doing really good. Yeah, so it's a lot of upkeep. It's a lot of work at home. You have to be very careful with them. And then you're up at the clinic way more often. Because that dog that we were talking about, the gunshot dog, you did a surgery. And then you saw him, what, like at, at when was his first recheck? I think I saw him at two weeks. At two weeks. And then again at two, four. And then you probably won't see him again until eight. And you're not re-wrapping and re-splinting. Because every time you have to re-splint, you're creating motion in that in that fracture again, which, mm-hmm. one, hurts the animal. And so a lot of times you have to sedate them for that. And two, impedes the healing process. Right. So the, the only financial benefit of a splint over a, a fracture repair, what I, what I say is a proper fracture repair, I'll get into that in a minute, is the, the surgery is all up front. Of course, the splint, you're spreading it out. You know, you Over have, those you have two or three months. Half of it up front, typically, is yeah. the, the first part of it. 
And then you spread the rest of it out in seven to 10 day payments mm-hmm. because that's that's how often you're back in the clinic. Yep. But there are some cases that, that you have to put a splint on. And I've got one right now that I think I get to pull his splint off probably Monday and he doesn't have to wear it anymore. His actually wasn't a fracture. He dislocated his hawk and there was enough of it still intact that I'm like, I don't really want to go fuse that hawk where it can't bend anymore. It's worth the try to try to restabilize yeah, that joint. It's worth the try to stabilize it. I, I wrapped him fry, Friday. Was I here last Friday or were you on back Friday? No, I was here. Yeah, we were here Friday. This is Friday before that. So, well, it was Thursday then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was Thursday. Put his wrap on. Everything felt good. I mean, the hawk felt fine. I just didn't want to take the chance on leaving it unwrapped. Because I know we're still pretty fresh in there because we're only three Yeah, because you need time for that injury. tissue to kind of tighten up. And, and a lot of those, you know, all the, you know, the, the body will create kind of a protection around that joint to try to stabilize it mm-hmm. as well. And, and it, it's what it's doing, and it's doing it well. I mean, that joint will always be bigger than the other one. Mm-hmm. There's no way to get around that. Because that thickened tissue like a scar, yeah. which gets us back to the callus. So you were saying, so the, the you ideally, you want to line them up so the little tree trunk tubules all go in line. But what right. if that doesn't happen? And if that doesn't happen, which, I mean, honestly, it's probably 70% of I the time. I was going to say, far, I far mean, it's, most. It's quite, yeah. quite a bit more. Uh, you know, I mean, if you have that nice, quick, clean, high force trauma that'll just snap a bone right there, no shards, no shatter, anything like that, those are the ones you can line back up that way. Very few of our fractures come in that way. So what happens is you line them up the best you can. And, you know, and like I said, like the one we were talking about, the the first one, there just wasn't bone there. It was gone. Yeah. They it was outside just, the body. Yeah. It left. Left. left it left the, the scene. Yes. So there's nothing there to put back together. And a fair gap in between. Yeah. So what you do is you put everything in position to where it should be of the pieces that you have left. And then the body just starts dumping everything it needs in that area, in that void, to make bone. Mm-hmm. You know, you got your your calcium, your magnesium, all your all your elements in there, and it just it dumps it in there. It takes the five gallon bucket and it just throws it there. Yeah, and patches it up. It says, "All right, put this together; it'll hold." Yeah. So in there, and, it, then, and that's what it does. It forms a big callus. It, I've seen those calluses get three to four times the size of what the bone should be. Yeah, and I I liken them to like little bridges. Like it's building a bridge across from one side to the other, and then fills in the holes in the middle over time. Right. Yeah, that, I mean that they look like bridges when you look at them on an X-ray. They do. I mean, they do, like you're, yeah, you could think of you're getting ready to build a bridge over this little creek. Well, you need to get to the creek, the other side of the creek today. Mm-hmm. Okay. You need a really nice bridge there. Yes. They've got to go build the bridge. Then they've got to haul it out here. Then they've got to set it up. So we're two months from being able to get a really nice bridge here. We've got to be over there tomorrow. Right. So you take the dozer and you just start shoving dirt in the creek. Yeah. So, you've so at we least... can drive over. Right. And then as we get that, now we have we have our dirt bridge. It doesn't look pretty. It doesn't. But it starts to function. It lays down the yeah the base. Yeah, and in order for that to happen, the bones, again, have to be stable. They can't mm-hmm. be willy-nilly moving around right. or your dozer's just driving off into the creek. Yeah, I mean, because you're, you know, if you don't stabilize those, then now you have quicksand on both sides of the creek. And you're... You, oh, that's you, a way better analogy. Good job. And you can, I mean, push all you want with the dozer, but it's going to end up sinking in the quicksand and you're not going to get anywhere. Yep, and that's basically it in a nutshell. So, yeah, yeah, it's bridge building. It is. And so what, there's six forces kind of torn down into three that we have to eliminate in any fracture. Rotational. Yeah. Rotational. <laughs> Dang it, that's only one I pulled up. <laughs> Which, and there's two ways that it'll rotate, co- uh-huh. clockwise and counterclockwise. So there's two of your mm-hmm. six forces. And then you have bending. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought there was going to be a fancy name for it. That's why I didn't guess. There may be. Okay. That's why it's bending. But yeah. Bending, which is going like, you know, back and forth. Mm-hmm. Which should be. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're okay. professionals, guys. Don't worry. We got this. Well, you took me out of order because rotation is always my last one. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you got the the bending, and then you have distraction. I don't remember what they call the other one. Basically, retraction. Retraction. Yeah, where it's trying to pull apart and slide over each other. 
Yeah, which that's a really common thing. Like when we have a dog that gets, let's say, you know, whatever reason it breaks its leg, and the owner, let's say it was a hit by car, and the dog was scared to death, so it ran out into the woods, and it took them two days to find it. And then they had to bring it back in because it was a Sunday, and now it's Monday. And a lot of times there will be this contraction that has happened at those muscle bellies, and that those bones will overlap each other, and so you have to to like pull back to re-lengthen the leg bone right to line them back up which is really hard and sometimes it is not as hard as trying to break down a callus that formed in the wrong place those are rough yeah that yeah. now you got to bring out the demo crew for the for the wrong bridge yeah yeah we gotta gotta bring out the big dozers and excavators remove the wrong bridge and now start putting the new bridge in after we do the bulldozer yeah, and that's after we've <laughs> driven over it for like a month, so it's packed. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And those then, are um, those are those are really those are rough. Yeah, we have to add s- extra time on the schedule we for do. that. We do. I, I don't want very many people in my surgery room at that point when I start doing those because they learn a new vocabulary. <laughs> so those are rough. Yeah, um, I you mean, sweat. I, I've definitely yeah. walked in and seen little the, the beads of sweat yeah. rolling. Yeah, those those get a little rough. You know, if we can if we can get to them, ideally, you know, the sooner we get to the fracture, the better. As long as the patient's stable. You know, you know, as soon said as, the medicine lady. Hold on, yeah. don't take my dog's surgery yet. I got to yeah. stabilize it first. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and which is right, but it's so as soon as we can feasibly get them to surgery, is when we want to. You know. As soon as we can feasibly get them to surgery, maybe two weeks down the road. Yep. Because we've got a lot of trauma. We have some, because it was hit by car. We've got some lung contusions. We've got a lot of abrasions. We've got lacerations in there that we've got to get cleaned up. So, yeah, would I like to be doing surgery 24 to 36 hours after the fracture? Of course, because there's not near as much swelling, very little contraction. It's a whole lot easier to put it back together. The body hasn't starting started to remodel that bone, so it all the puzzle pieces, Are if they're all still there, yeah, they fit together. Because that's a good point, too. Like, before the callus is even really forming, the sharp edges and stuff are kind of being sanded down and, rough, you know, and, and, and the the little tiny shards are being kind of treated like foreign debris at this point because they've lost their blood flow, so they're getting resorbed. Right. Yeah, so, you know, if we can get there, you know, as soon as we can, the sooner we can get to a fracture repair, the easier it is for us to fix one, the better our outcome will be. Better may not be the right word. The easier the it will easier, be it will, to easier achieve recovery that. Will yeah, be. Uh-huh. they'll the recover the faster. Will be. They will recover faster. It won't have, yeah. typically, run you less chance of complications mm-hmm. in there, you know, as far as. Malunions or, or the failure to the, the form a callus. To, failures to form a callus. And then, you know, the, it's just, it. Like the it body made, got sick of haul, hauling the, the, the dirt to the location. Yeah. yeah. It was just, it was tired. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm done. Yeah. Hauled as much dirt as I'm going to. I'm, I'm done. I'm wore out. Yeah. And that gets into a whole nother ball of wax. But you get, yeah, I think our last rough one was probably September, October. I think it was. I can't, I remember the x rays when they came over from the hospital, but I, yeah. I don't recall the time because time is weird for me uh, right now. I, I mean, it, it, we were in this building. I remember yeah, that. Everything so it's is been like, since it's like April. before COVID, after COVID, before the tornado, after the tornado. And then soon it'll be when we were in the tent building versus when we we're in the new building. Right. This is how right. we tell time. That's our time frame. So yeah. anything from April, April to, to now is <laughs> just the tornado. Yeah, the other day. Um, exactly. <laughs> seems like it was about four months ago. It might have been in May. It may have been in December. I don't know. Yeah. This dog had a fracture. That actually had two of them. One had a fracture. They didn't know it. The dog. I think the dog was missing for a couple, two, three weeks. I was going to say two, three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd been missing for a little bit, and was just because the body had already started trying to heal Mm -hmm. where it was, and so it was just limping a little bit. Well. You know, they're like, well, he's, he's limping just a little bit, so we'll see if it gets better and whatnot. And rocks on another week, take to her primary veterinarian. Because he's not getting better. He's not yep. getting better. You know, make an appointment there. I think it might have been a, a day or two before they their schedules could, could align. And you get there, take they take an x-ray, and sure enough, leg has a fracture. 
So call us, hey, can you fix this? Yeah, we should be able to. And then they send the x-rays, and I was like, oh, crap, what did I get myself into? <laughs> I already said yes. Yeah, I already said yes. So, okay, why not just let the dog go the way he is? On that one, as he wasn't, wasn't a big dog, but he wasn't a little dog either. Like That's kind of that 25, 30 pounds. Yeah, I think he might have been 30, 35-ish. Okay. So not huge, but not little. That was going to make that leg, as much as we'd had the contraction, that, you know, mind you, you know, 30-pound dog isn't that big. I think when I f- ended up measuring it, that leg would have been almost two inches shorter. Which is other. probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, what, 20% shorter? I'm, I'm just ballparking it. I don't know what kind of. Prime, probably 25 on that yeah. one. Yeah, which then, you know, leads to arthritis, typically in the, and so that leg obviously hurts because it doesn't function normal. And then you get arthritis in the other leg. Because it's having to bear an abnormal amount of weight, and then you get back problems from not tracking normally. There's just so many reasons why that's not your ideal scene. Yeah, now, the dog would have survived, no dog doubt. Dog would have survived. Dog would have functioned for some time. But yeah, you're going to get arthritis in the other. You're going to get arthritis in this leg. One, you get arthritis in the other leg, and then just from bearing that much extra weight. Now, because it, it was a back leg, so now as the dog's walking, you know we go. Say we go six months down the road, everything's healed up. Dog's walking. Well, now this one side of the hip is two inches lower than the other. So now you've got torque on the hip, torque on the SI joint, torque on all the lumbar vertebrae, going all the way up to the thoracic vertebrae. And you just, every joint that you have in there. Is in an unnatural position? It's in an unnatural position. So you will have osteoarthritis. Like, yeah, try walking around with one, like, ladies, with one high heel on for just a day. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be, be the exact same thing. It'd be the exact same thing. One it's also it's bad on the stifle of the short leg because it's kind of trying to toe touch and reach yeah. down for the ground, and they're not bearing weight. Yeah, so they're straightening the up properly. all of yeah. those joints. Getting post-legged on that. So now we'll tear that ACL Yep. and have to go in and do that surgery. That's amazing. Max hasn't torn his ACL. He probably, maybe he has, like, micro. He probably has a micro tear. He hasn't fully torn it. No. Yeah. Anyway, because he's so post-legged. Yeah, he is. God love him. Yeah, I was expecting to do both of his stifled warriors, too. Honestly, I know. Well, you did have to do his hip surgery when he was two. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we digress. Okay, I want to just take another quick time out because this is, I think, before I forget to mention this and before we run out of time, I want to just address the fact that some fractures are more emergent than others. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself in a situation where your dog has a broken leg, or your cat, obviously, depending on why they broke it, let's say that it was hit by a car. Yes, this is an emergency. Full stop. Broken leg or not. Second scenario might be like a direct impact. Like we see a lot of like horse kicks or cow kicks that will just break a leg. The most dangerous fracture, would you agree with me, is the femur, which is your upper leg bone. Mm -hmm. Because if that sharp edge of that bone lacerates the femoral artery in that dog. It's it. It's over. And so that dog's going to bleed out in many cases. And so the, from a medical standpoint, like, so as, as the non-surgeon in this group, my goal, when these dogs come in, they've been hit by a car and they have a back leg fracture or any leg fracture really, but especially the back legs, the goal is systemic stabilization and to splint the leg until surgery. So there's not wiggling about, like the dog doesn't sit on it wrong or move too much and cause a femoral laceration. Right. And the bad thing about the femurs is, which is that the upper leg bone. On the back. On the back. There is not a good way to splint them. No, it's so, so I mean, even to, even to hold them steady, you know, it comes in at 4.30 this evening, say. You get a dog come in, femur fracture. And we just need to stabilize it till in the morning, mm-hmm. till we can get to surgery at nine o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the back half of this dog ends up looking kind of like a mummy. Yeah, because you have to wrap all the way up the leg and then around the pelvis and abdomen to keep, because you're supposed to stabilize a joint above and below, right? That makes sense. You can't stabilize, you know, a, a broken middle piece without getting a hold of the top and bottom anchor points. And so, yeah, you have to go all the way around them. They have a difficult time going to the bathroom. I mean, it's a very temporary fix, but 
when you can't go to surgery at, you know, at seven o'clock at night or whatever, then that is the next best thing. And plus a lot of these dogs are pretty painful. So they're on some, some pain medications that help keep them relaxed and sedated so that they're more comfortable and quiet until surgery the next day. Yeah. And, and most of those at that point, they're not stable enough to go under anesthesia to go to surgery. So exactly. To do something. Mm-hmm. And there, yeah, we try to get, especially the female to mm-hmm. not move until we can get to surgery mm-hmm. just because there's so much. I mean, you got another minor thing in there that's not too far from the femoral artery, which carries all the blood supply to and from the leg or to the leg. There's this little thing called the sciatic nerve Mercy, that's yeah. uh, not too far from there. Yeah. And I know a lot of people out there listening probably have sciatic of sciatica. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, where you feel all of that pain in your leg. Mm-hmm. Just imagine you cut that leg. Now you can feel nothing and you have no function in that leg. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, the femur is probably the most, as far as, as leg fractures, the femur is probably the most um, critical one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, may, and critical what may not even mean be that. According to, uh, as far as leg fractures, what, or like a skull fracture, is that what you're comparing it to at this spine point? Spine fracture. Oh, spinal fracture. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't even like to think about those. Yeah. Those are usually bad news bears. Yeah, they're they're usually not good. Those those we've got to get on and quick too. Yeah, that's a whole different topic. We won't go there today. Not today. But yeah, the the femur fractures are the one that you can have the most negative impact from not getting them stabilized soon enough. Yeah, in there, you know, I mean, all all the rest of them, you will have some negative impact not getting them stable. But the most, most of those are not consequence. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. So that's the emergency answer. Is it an emergency? Sometimes, yes. Definitely if it's a femur. Yes. Definitely if it's a femur. Definitely if there's a lot of soft tissue trauma. Definitely if the dog took a systemic hit. But if they like break their toe or break a front leg, it is less urgent. You know, this is a, it's okay to sleep it off and come in in the morning kind of thing, in um, my opinion. Dr. Dane might say otherwise. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not not life threatening. The other one that is emergent that we haven't mentioned is any open fracture. Okay. By open fracture, that means there is a piece of bone sticking through the skin. Yeah, because those dogs can get very sick very fast. You have a, a very finite amount of time before you get the gangrene risk, and then the bone itself should not be getting exposed to air, and so that causes some compromise. And then, of course, the bones don't have a great blood supply. I mean, they've got a decent blood supply, but not like a muscle does. Mm-mm. So if you get an infection on or in that bone, Trying to get that resolved. Osteomyelitis is, is like month long, months, months, and months of yeah. medicine. Yeah, I mean, you can and we can get and we get. I think most of them resolved, but yeah, I mean, we're on medication for at the bare minimum one month, probably average two and a half, mm-hmm. and some of them are on it for five and six months. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one healer that had that front leg fracture that was done somewhere else before we ever met her. And and she kept getting this fistula, this draining tract from her osteomyelitis around that plate. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to put her on antibiotics for a couple of months, then go in and finally remove the plate, and then still antibiotics for months. Yeah, I think she was on antibiotics total. It was at least six, if it wasn't seven months. Uh, yeah, and there I was think, a yeah. time in there because we had to buy some more time because the fracture wasn't completely healed. Because so it it's not going to heal well when it's infected. Right. So we had to get the infection at least knocked down enough that the bone could heal because what what was the issue was the implant. The infection had gotten around the implant. There is no blood supply to the implant. It's a piece of metal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just doesn't have blood supply. Yeah. So you can't fight the infection on the implant in the body. Yeah. So we had to get it cleaned up enough that the bone could heal enough that we could take the implant out, and which took us about two months. And I, I want to say we were already, dog was probably already eight weeks in after surgery. Oh, it like was, that. no, it was, a, it was a lot longer was than, it was like that? six months post-surgery was it that long? when the fistula, they came to us for it. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it was, it I remember it was about 18 months from the time she broke her leg to when we were finally like, ta-da. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, that was an ordeal. It was an ordeal. So yeah, infection is, you know, it actually happened to one of my family members had a, 
a total hip and it got infected. So they had to take out the implant and port, put in a porcelain implant, which isn't long-term sustainable. And then you get that cleaned up in the infection, take the porcelain implant in and put in the lifelong one, titanium or whatever they put in people. I don't know. And I mean, it was a fiasco. And that was, that was probably what, a six month ordeal. Oh, it was probably longer than that. But from the first surgery to the, when the last surgery was healed, it was, yeah, it was, I bet it was nine because it was a month in when they went back to the first one. Right. So it was, no, it was a while. It was a mess. Yeah. It wasn't a short term thing. No. But anyway, yeah. So I'm sure if you're having a total hip, that will not happen to you. <laughs> and there's always a risk. There is. It, I mean, and that's the thing is that, yeah, I mean, it is always a risk because this is a trauma to the body and surgery is not a benign thing, but it, you know, must be done to get the best outcome for these guys. So right. what about toes? Do you fix toes or do you just splint them? It depends. My preference, I mean, I'll, I'll start the whole statement off with my preference. If I can do surgery and put an implant in there to fix a bone, that is what I'm doing. We can, they did. They, they do make some small fins. We look and assess what we're what we're dealing with. You know, there's four. I mean, basically, you think of your hand. You know, between your fingers and your thumb, <clears throat> there's your metacarpals. There's four going across there. Dogs have the same thing, and cats. And so we look. Our dogs and cats. You, of course, they they walk on the equivalent of our hands. <clears throat> So they have to be weight bearing. You're the two most important ones for weight bearing are the two center ones. So those are the ones so, you're most worried about fixing. Those are the ones we're most worried about fixing. You know, if if you fracture one of the other ones, there's a lot of times we won't do anything. We just mm -hmm. rest and let it heal because the other three are still intact enough to hold everything stable enough to let that heal and be completely functional. <clears throat> and then you'll have those that'll come in and they'll break all four. Mm-hmm. I remember one got stepped on by a horse, broke all four of them just straight across. Well, there was that Australian shepherd that ha was in, he warded off a break in. There was, there was a burglar and this dog chased them out and like was attacking them essentially. And I think one of the, one of the burglar people like took the, like the end table that was out on the patio and threw it down at him and it landed on his foot and broke his foot. his foot. Yeah, that was... we And that was a lot of soft tissue trauma and it took us forever to get that soft tissue healed up. Yeah, I mean, we were we were 18 months. That's how we got into that Novox, wasn't it? With those Novox pads? Oh, no, that was See, that, that was the Wickwear dog. That was the Wickwear dog. Anyway, um, we digress. No, we got into something on him, though. We did a lot of laser therapy. We did a lot, a lot of, of just sugar wraps at first. Did and ended up going in and having to amputate, do two amputations on him. On uh, what? Toes? On the toes. It was the, if I remember right, it was the outside toe first. That one was pretty early on, like in a month. We just had so much soft tissue trauma. There was not a blood supply that that outside bone died mm -hmm. in there. But I think that was just the toe. I don't think that was the metacarpal. Mm -mm. And then, so we rocked on for a little while longer and we're trying to get, finally got everything, got a scar over it. But one of the bad things with scars is if it's not on a, a meaty area of the body, even on us, those scars will contract. Mm -hmm. We thought we were sitting good, doing good, got it healed up. It's a big scar. You know, it doesn't look pretty, but it's healed. And then that scar started tightening up and then we lost more blood supply. So then we had to go back in and finish amputating that all the way up to the wrist. Mercy. And there, and then there were still, I think two of the metacarpals still had pins in them. Actually, that metacarpal actually had a pin in it and it just didn't heal. Yeah. And we just had to take it off. So, yeah. And I mean, a lot of it, it depends, depends on what we're, we're setting with. And like the other one that I have, you know, said I've got, Earlier in the podcast that I've got two right now that are in a splint. One's that hawk luxation. The other was metacarpal, two fractures, one dislocation. The problem with that one is that the fracture was so close to the joint oh. that there's not enough bone left to be able to I put any kind of to, yeah. implant in. Yeah. So I just, there's, there's not enough there to put an implant in. So I just had to straighten it out, get everything lined back up put a splint on it, hold it there, and let that start heal. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I want to say there was the two that fractured were like 
maybe two millimeters from the Mm-mm. from the end of the bone. Yeah, that's that's nothing. And there's just nothing, nothing yep. there. Luckily, most of the time, those metacarpal metatarsal fractures aren't that close to the joint. So, and the splints are less complicated on those too. They are. They don't have to go up near as high in there, and they. I mean, we still get pressure sores. You, I don't care what you do. It happens. It happens. I mean, splint, cast, whatever you want to put on there. I would love to find a doctor that puts those on and never has any pressure sores because I want to learn the technique. Yeah. So if you know any, call us. Yeah, because there's I have never put on a splint or a cast that did not end up with a pressure sore. Yeah. And it's just because we don't form our cast. I mean, well, we do form our cast. But, but you've got there's so many different protuberances off of the, you know, little knots and bone bone sticking out or whatnot. As and then the paw pads and then the carpal pads. Yeah. And all of that sticking out that you can't or I, I say you can't. I have not found a way to be able to get enough pressure to hold the fracture steady and not have too much pressure on some of those points. It's like wearing wooden shoes all day, like, you know, Dutch shoes. And right. You know you're going to get blisters. Yeah, because your foot, it's not going to fit your foot. No, because it, it's not meant to bend and flex. It's meant yeah. to be steep. I mean, it's like anytime anybody buys a new pair of shoes, how long does it take you to get them what we call broken in? Listen, hokas don't take long at all. Literally day one, you're walking on clouds. Hokas all the way. Pretty close. I mean, it's like, mm, it took me about a day and a half. Not me. Oh, it's the best day. day I, mean, I mean, I got some jacked up feet though. So I like I like Hoka's boots are a different story. Boots are process. Yeah. Anyway, we got her. We got to we got to wrap her up, man. She's almost forty five minutes long. I all, the I doctor think, that doesn't talk. The doctor, the doctor talks the least has the longest podcast. I know every that? time because you're very thorough, and so I'm asking you pointed questions that you're giving answers for. Whereas in exam rooms, you just listen. And That's wait true. and wait in awkward silence until they say more stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. But find out what I need to know. There you go. Eventually they get there. All right, cool. Well, y'all, I hope you learned something about fractures. If you ever have questions about them or if you found yourself in a position with a dog with a fracture or cat, Dr. Trussell is very, very good at what he does and loves it very, very much. And so we are here to help. We are. All right. I think that's it. So, yeah, just leaving words. Some fractures or emergencies you need to help right now. Some are not. We can come in in the morning, but they all need to be addressed. Absolutely. They all need addressed. And with that, we leave you uh, to your own devices. That's it. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Bye.